Hello, everyone, and welcome to Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, a 27-year veteran of the NYPD. News from Suffolk County. And for many, this news is sad news. For many uh, people that don't understand the politics of the region, it was it's not a surprise to me. Um, and, of course, what we're talking about right now it's what you see on the screen. Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison resigns. And Commissioner Harrison's legacy will be one of professionalism, integrity, and progress. After the, the sudden re resignation of Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison, County Executive Steve Ballone uh, released a statement Friday thanking Harrison for his service. Harrison announced Thursday night that he'd be leaving the position, according to the New York Post. The news came just under four months after the arrest of Rex Uerman, the suspect in the Gilgo Beach killings. For the last two years, Commissioner Rodney Harrison has led the Suffolk County Police with honor, integrity, and distinction, distinction according to Ballone. Because of his efforts, our communities are safer, the department is more equitable, accountable, and transparent, and meaningful relationships have been fostered with our diverse communities. Harrison's achievements are innumerable, Ballone said, including the continued implementation of the county's police reform plan, investments in officer safety, and tackling quality of life issues. But the most significant in his tenure is the arrest of alleged serial killer in connection to the Gilgo Beach homicide investigation. Ballone added, on the day I nominated Commissioner Harrison for the post, this was on December 14th, 2021, I specifically cited the Gilgo Beach serial murder case as the top priority. I said that Commissioner Harrison would bring to bear his extensive investigative experience on the case and work with our federal, state, and local partners to help bring closure to the victims and their families. During his first week on the job alone, said Harrison toured the Gilgo site himself and made a commitment to families to do everything in his power to solve the case. And just six weeks later, he established the Gilgo Beach Homicide Investigation Task Force on February 15th, 2022, which ultimately uh, led to the arrest in the case. Harrison Ballone said was the first person ever to rise from the NYPD cadet program to become the top uniform officer in the largest police department in the nation. He continued to make history in Suffolk County as the first black commissioner in the department's history. The Suffolk County Police Department is one of the greatest police departments in the nation, and Commissioner Harrison's legacy here will be one of professionalism, integrity, and progress. And according to Bologna, he extends his genuine gratitude to the commissioner for his historic service to our country and wish him the very best in his future endeavors. In October, Harrison attended a press conference with attorney John Ray regarding possible new evidence in the Gilgo case. And we'll, we'll speak about that a little later. One of the things I just wanted to add is that police commissioner Rodney Harrison came out to Suffolk County from with the New York swagger, as we call it, you know, and he, he established what was known as a task force, a task force, which is a common word used in the NYPD. And he brought his investigative techniques from the NYPD out to Suffolk County with a new attitude and trying to instill in the investigators that were already there, no doubt some very talented ones, what was going to be inspected. And you know, the old expression, there's a new sheriff in town, and we're gonna make some changes. And that's what I believe Rodney Harrison did. And he brought this professionalism and respect and investigative know-how. And from day one, went to the crime scene and went to a case that seemed at some point unsolvable and said what was almost unthinkable at the time. I think this case is very solvable. And that instilled a lot of confidence 
and the people that worked for him, and no doubt this task force operated with a great deal of pride, respect, investigative know-how, and knowledge of the case from years and years and years. Notably, there were many problems with this case from the very beginning. And when you think about a case that can, goes back 27 years, if we, if we include the, the case of Karen Vergata, and with bodies strewn all over the place, this is no doubt a very difficult case. And he brought this integrity and this know-how to the investigation. So folks, hang on to your seats, hang on to your hats. You vented the police off the cuff, off the cub zone. There has to be some common sense. Yes, sir. They have the car stopped in ten and branch microbiter. We still don't know who pulled the trigger. You know, one of the first things that Rodney Harrison did when he went out to Suffolk County and when he spoke to Supervisor Ballone, County Executive Ballone, and he intended to make this Gilgo Beach case the highest priority in his administration. And like a good homicide investigator, Rodney Harrison wanted to go to the crime scene. Take me out to the crime scene. Any good homicide investigator knows that's where the case begins and ends. And you need to go to the crime scene to take a look, to get the feel, to get that sixth sense that all great investigators have. And that's, in fact, what Rodney Harrison did. Things under arrest. Harrison is talking exclusively to News Force Miles Miller about the investigation and what it took to break the case. Rodney Harrison's first task after being sworn in as Suffolk County Police Commissioner was to visit the site of the department's biggest cold case. There's a commitment, a relentless pursuit to identify the individuals and bring them to justice. Today, for the first time... I thought it was important that I uh, uh, came out here and kind of took a look at uh, the whole landscape of uh, where these bodies were discovered. Commissioner Harrison speaking exclusively to News 4 at the crime scene his first time back. Tell me about the uniqueness of this, that it's a marquee area, and if it was not all connected to the same person, the fact that this could just be a dumping ground. Yeah, listen, once again, this is a lot more work that needs to be done. Um, are we going to connect uh, the other bodies um, that we're still investigating to uh, Mr. Hewerman? Well, time will tell. Harrison's detective charged Rex Hewerman on Friday with the murders of three sex workers, Megan Waterman, Melissa Bartholomew, and Amber Costello. Their bodies found bound and wrapped in burlap. What tells you that maybe those other bodies that were there may not be connected to this? Well, I'm not ruling it out, but I will say that something about the burlap, something about how the strangulations were done, uh, kind of had a lot of similarities. The first step to solving this case set up a task force involving one sergeant and three detectives from Suffolk County Police who took a closer look at the case. It really uh, was probably the best thing that I think I did because uh, we got to take a look at the crime stopper tips and where those followed, jail calls, the briefings. An old tip about the truck driven by the last person to see Amber Costello alive broke the case wide open. There was a guy who uh, was a, I will say, a customer of, uh, of Amber Costello, and uh, he used to drive a green avalanche. Uh, he was an ogre. He was six foot six. He was 275 pounds. He had bushy hair. The task force had only been established for a month when a state police investigator used the special vehicle database to link a Chevy avalanche that showed up at the home of Amber Costello in 20. 10 to Rex Hewerman. Among the evidence, a DNA sample taken from a pizza crust Hewerman threw away. Police say his DNA matched a sample taken from a male strand of hair 
found on duct tape used to tie up one of Hurman's alleged victims. Really have to credit our undercovers with not being what we would call being raised up and having our suspect become aware that he's being followed and uh, surveilled by uh, the police department. The task force continues to execute search warrants at locations connected to Hurman. On Gilgo Beach, I'm Miles Miller. So that was a little bit of a review of this case and, of course, of the leadership qualities uh, of Rodney Harrison. And look, I cannot um, be prouder of a former uh, NYPD chief of department coming out to Suffolk County, coming to an investigation that somehow was thought to be unsolvable. And whether that was true or not, but let's look how far it goes back and how many bodies were recovered here. And we always think of, we, it always goes back to the victims and the names on the screen right there. And uh, Marine Brainerd Barnes, Melissa Bartolome, Amberlynn Costello, and Megan Waterman, victims. And something they had in common that potentially could have hurt the investigation from a perspective, perhaps, or a culture. And it was alleged by many outside the investigation that perhaps the Suffolk County police didn't work as hard on this case because they were all escorts. And we would hope that not to be true, that that had absolutely nothing to do with this. However, there is a possibility, and we can't forget that in this case, it goes back to some corruption. Chief James Burke, who was in charge of this investigation for approximately, uh, I believe it was four years. And during his tenure, really very little was done. In fact, it, it went backwards in a way because they, they took the FBI off the case. And then we, you know, I, Rodney Harrison never wanted to focus on that. He wanted to move forward. He wanted to say, no, well, that happened, but we're going to move forward. We think we could solve this case. And let's put behind uh, what may have happened in the past that may have thwarted the solvability of this case, that may have put this case on the back burner instead of the front burner. We're going to move forward. We're going to start this task force. This is when they announced the arrest which was almost unthinkable. When people on Long Island, and I grew up on Long Island, I grew up in Levittown, approximately 25 minutes from Massapequa Park where Rex Hewman lived. So I know Long Island. I know Jones Beach. I know Gilgo Beach. I know that area. And uh, to think of a serial killer out on Long Island was almost unthinkable. And then to think that it wasn't solved for all those years you wondered, what the hell is going on? Is it that difficult to solve this case? Here's Rodney Harrison announcing the arrest. In the Gilgo investigation, uh, last night, a little bit around 8.30 p.m. in the vicinity of 35th and 5th Avenue in the city, uh, members assigned to the Gilgo Beach Task Force, which consisted of numerous detectives and investigators from the Suffolk County Police Department, as well as our partners in the FBI, uh, did place one individual under arrest, transported him back to 30 Yapank, which is our headquarters, and he's currently in custody at this time. The case is in grand jury. Uh, we anticipate an indictment uh, later on this afternoon, and we're going to probably have a press conference around four to five o'clock this afternoon with the uh, district attorney and a lot of the other leadership that uh, law enforcement has out here in Suffolk County. Uh, I do have to take advantage of this opportunity and thank uh, the teamwork, the effort, the work by all the members of the task force uh, allowing us to get to this point today. Uh, it was a collaborative effort. Um, uh, the resilient work that was done allowed us to place somebody into custody. But once again, is this, uh, there will be a, a lot more detailed press conference later on today, four o'clock, uh, out in Riverhead at the district attorney's office.
You know, a lot of you um, folks in the chat are, are saying like, oh, no, Rodney Harrison's gone. Rodney Harrison resigned. I I, I just wanted to uh, reiterate that he was appointed by Steve Ballone. Steve Ballone, who is the county executive, the Suffolk County executive, is not running or perhaps that from term limits he, he had did 12 years. He's not allowed to run for another term. So Rodney Harrison potentially um, and probably most likely would have been out of a job in December anyway, because whoever the new county executive is, is pretty much going to put his own person in there, is going to put his own appoint. Could it happen that he would keep Rodney Harris? It could, but that's usually not the case. I think it happened in Nassau County uh, with Patrick Ryder was reappointed by the next county executive. But so this is timely for Rodney Harrison. This is really perfect timing. And the fact that he's going out on top, you know, and Rodney Harrison is only 54 years old. He's accomplished a hell of a lot. Could he be the police commissioner of another jurisdiction? I'm sure if he wants to, you know, because he's got tremendous credentials. What does this do for his worth as as a police executive? I mean, he's a first round draft pick, right? And when we think of how difficult, again, this case was, and we see the the people on the screen there, and we talk about how how difficult this case was to solve. And he came in from New York City with confidence, with that swagger, I call it, the New York swagger, and brought that out to Suffolk County. And were there problems? It seems to me that, and, you know, Ray Tierney, who is the Suffolk County District Attorney, and Rodney Harrison, I don't know if they were exactly on the same page. Um, when the, when the arrest was first taken, uh, was first made of Rex Ewerman, when he was first arrested, um, there's a picture of old, old Rex there. Uh, it seemed like Ray Tierney was on every single TV station there was. And I, for me, that's not the job of a district attorney. I think the police commissioner should have been taking a bow. And I, I, I personally didn't like that. And, uh, so it seemed that Ray Tierney, the Suffolk County DA, wanted to be the talking head in regards to this case rather than um, the police commissioner, Rodney Harrison. When they spoke about the task force, it seemed that also Ray Tierney was trying to take credit for, for establishing the task force. And it would seem to me that that was a police thing, you know. Let's establish a task force. And what was included in that task force? Well, the Suffolk County Police, the New York State Police, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office investigators, uh, a creative one, the Suffolk County Correction, the jails, uh, Chief uh, Sheriff Toulon, who certainly <clears throat> they use their investigative depth and breadth by talking to other sex workers within the Suffolk County Jail. Whether that paid dividends or not, I don't know. But the state police and Rodney Harrison fully gave credit to a female detective. Just remember they had that information on that green Chevy Avalanche. And they had that for years and years. I think they had that for over... 10 or 12 years, 12 years, and nothing was done with it. And then this state police investigator runs it through a database that we all know in law enforcement called Lawman. And perhaps she ran it a different way, ran it as a truck or ran it this way or ran it that way, and they came up with it. A green Chevy Avalanche in Massapequa Park, New York. Wow. And then connecting, of course, all the burner phones and all the information and the, the technology that surely in 2023 was much better than it was in 2012. Uh, 
So all of these things came, what, 2010. All of these things came together. And the science, when you put investigation is an art and it's a science. And when you put those two things together with talented investigators, it's a tough thing to beat. And of course, who did they bring back in? They brought the FBI back in. Why the FBI was ever kicked out of the investigation to begin with is part of the whole corruption thing we were talking about going back to Chief James Burke and the district attorney Spoda. So all of those things are reasons why leadership, great leadership, which is what Rodney Harrison brought to this. He brought leadership. He brought an investigative know-how to this case. And that, um, that in itself could get this task force together and get it together and get the investigators on the right track. And then once they got this green avalanche <clears throat> identified that was in the case folder since 2012, all of a sudden now they came up with this six foot six inch man, a Rex human. And the burner phones pinged in certain locations in Manhattan, in Midtown, in Massapequa Park. All of a sudden, the investigation that was way out here started tightening up. It started tightening up, and they started building this case. And again, because of excellent leadership by Rodney Harrison. However, the, were there problems? Absolutely. There, there were problems in this case. There was no doubt there was problems. But they, they brought... They brought everyone together and people worked together and they put the problems of the past aside and they worked together. Long Island, Rodney Harrison. He was the one who broke open one of the state's coldest murder cases ever. I would assume reporter Safan Kim with the breaking details of a real shocker. Safan. Well, Bill, the former NYPD chief of department in an internal memo to Suffolk County officers informed them he will be stepping down. The Suffolk County Police Commissioner is resigning after nearly two years on the job. Rodney Harrison, of course, helped the department crack the infamous Gilgo Beach serial killings case. Before taking the commissioner job, he vowed to capture a suspect in that case, which had gone unsolved for over a decade. Harrison told officers he will inform Suffolk County Executive Steve Ballone on Friday about his decision to resign. Ballone's office late tonight confirming the news. Ballone is not running for re-election this Tuesday. The Democrat cannot run again due to term limits. Meanwhile, a red wave has been washing away Democratic seats in Suffolk County in recent years. Bill. Stefan, with the latest news. So, you know, for all you guys that are um, heartbroken over uh, Rodney Harrison resigning, it was inevitable. It really was inevitable. And we talk about, you know, going out on top. And, you know, we've been all been following and watching this investigation and so many things about the investigation, of course, uh, were painful. You know, the amount of time it took uh, to solve this case. Whether or not the effort was put in uh, to this case. All of these things are uh, became part of the gee whiz of, oh, well, maybe if we put a task force together. Maybe if we put some money into this, maybe if we invested some money into this investigation, and maybe if we put in, let's do a task force. Let's bring in the FBI though. The FBI has personnel and they got money. They got mucho dinero, right? So you bring in the FBI with all of their resources. You bring in the state police. You bring in the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. You bring in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office for Investigators. Nassau County, I know we don't hear that used. Nassau County was also involved in this case. Whether they were in fact part of the task force, I don't believe they're ever mentioned. But two of the bodies were recovered in Nassau County. 
So Nassau County, of course, was involved in this. To refresh you again with this case and what it was all about, the, the, the scope of it and how important it was, WPIX with Mary Murphy did some outstanding coverage on this case. And I just want to play a little bit of it because it gives, again, that overview. And whenever you use the word serial, serial killer, right away, there's a panic because by definition, the FBI says a serial killer is too or more murders with time in between. That becomes a serial killer. So this obviously was way more than that. Detectives tried to solve it. The bodies of four young women, all seriously decomposed, in fact, skeletal, were discovered over three days. Reporter Mike Sheehan told us about the discovery of the Gilgo Four in December 2010. A police canine finding the first victim, Melissa Bartholomew, in the brush off Ocean Parkway and the others were close by. Right now we're forensically uh, working with the bones and the bodies. Investigators initially believed the crime scene could be connected to another mystery. Detectives are now comparing these murders to the grisly discovery of four young women found in Atlantic City several years ago. Cops in Gilgo were looking for a missing sex worker from Jersey City, Shannon Gilbert. When they came upon the remains of Maureen Brainerd Barnes, Megan Waterman, Melissa Bartholomew, and Amber Costello, women who had also advertised escort services online. It's sad, and I just wanted to get a chance to see where my sister was. Amber Costello's sister got emotional on Ocean Parkway four months later. <laughs> when police announced they found more remains. In the area between Oak Beach and Google Beach. People are scared. Investigators ultimately found 10 sets of remains. One victim was a toddler, and her mother was found in another section of Ocean Parkway. And there were body parts tied to female torsos that had turned up 40 miles to the east in Matterville. Shannon Gilbert's remains were found a year after the Gilgo Four were discovered in Thick Marsh in Oak Beach. It's bogs, and you step in, you can sink sink way down. If it wasn't for Shannon Gilbert's disappearance, we may never have found the remains of the uh, the other victims. John, did you kill those two women? Nearly three years later, a father of two from Manorville was arrested for the cold case murders of two other sex workers in the early 90s, not far from his home. It was natural to question if Carpenter John Bitroff could be Lisk, the Long Island serial killer. Former District Attorney Tom Spoda insisted there was no investigative link. So I did all that up, you know. This is when PIX11 News kick-started its coverage of Gilgo, looking at the first known case of body parts connected to the elusive serial killer. Taking a boat to the eastern end of Fire Island, Davis Park. In 1996, two female legs were found here wrapped in plastic. Years later, during the serial killer investigation, a skull that was found in Tobey Beach was tested for DNA, and that DNA was matched later to the legs here in Davis Park. We still had nagging questions about the four women killed in New Jersey. After learning one victim, Kim Raffo, had spent time at a Long Island hotel before her death. On November 20th, 2006, two women came upon the body of 35-year-old Kim Raffo face down in a muddy ditch here in West Atlantic City, about 50 yards away from the Golden Key Motel. Police who arrived on the scene made more grisly discoveries. Three other dead women, all of them like Raffo, barefoot but fully clothed, and all of their heads facing east toward the casinos of Atlantic City. Any reason to think there might be a connection between the Gilgo Beach, Long Island killer, and what happened in Atlantic City. I'm not prepared to discuss that. There, there have been instances over the years where we have reached out to law enforcement authorities in the Midwest and uh, I think also in Canada. One of the more sensational developments in the Gilgo Beach investigation happened when James Burke, the former Suffolk County Chief of Department, was arrested for beating a drug-addicted burglary suspect who had stolen a bag from Burke's police vehicle. Embarrassing sex toys were found in the bag, and it emerged that Burke had been investigated for doing drugs with a sex worker in the 1990s, not securing his gun in the process. But the original chief of detectives in the Gilgo case, Dominic Ferrone, 
did not believe Burke was involved in the serial killings. You don't believe so? I don't believe so. Um, I really don't, and nor do I think it's the resident uh, of Oak Beach. In 2020, during the pandemic, then Suffolk County Police Commissioner Geraldine Hart announced in a phone call that police had finally identified a Jane Doe in the Gilgo case. Today, we are announcing that Jane Doe number six has been positively identified as Valerie Mack. Mack, a young mom, was last seen 17 miles from Atlantic City. Her torso was found in Matterville in 2000, and it took genetic genealogy to identify her 20 years later. We once again asked authorities about a potential Atlantic City connection. We've been in touch with the Atlantic City PD uh, throughout uh, 2020, but at this time there is no link. Um... They did an excellent job, uh, WPIX and Mary, Mary Murphy. Um, one of the things that, that we know now is that the Atlantic City cases uh, were not connected. Uh, they were not connected to the Gilgo cases. They did do a deep dive into that to see if in fact they were. Now, because Rodney Harrison um, has resigned and we, we talk about the inevitability of it and he's going out on top, he was a fantastic police commissioner. He's young, he's 54 years old. If he wants to do this work again, you know, he may be like, like a pro football coach, you know, that went out on top. Maybe he wants to take a job in media, get paid a lot of money and be a consultant and not have to work as hard as he, he works right now, you know? And I'm not suggesting that's what he's going to do, but maybe he wants to take a little break. You never know. These jobs are 24-7 uh, jobs. Your phone is always ringing and always when you're sleeping, you know? So we don't know what he's going to do next, but we know that he is going out on top. And uh, for that, we can we can applaud him and we can applaud his career and we can applaud what he did out in Suffolk County. Folks, this is Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories. If you like real crime or true crime from a police perspective, then you're in the right place. And if you're not subscribed to us, go on our YouTube, hit that subscribe button, give us a thumbs up and ring that bell. If you want to contribute to this channel, we have a Patreon with three different levels and we also have a YouTube channel membership with five different levels and you can support us in that way. You see the folks in the green font that are in our chat. They're part of our, our family, our friends, our subscribers, and we really appreciate everything they do for us. You know, there's a couple of things about this case, obviously. And the one thing about this case that no one wants to accept. And the reason I mentioned, of course, that's the Shannon Gilbert case. Um, and they want many people think that that's part of this the, the whole Gilgo Beach corruption thing, and that she was murdered. And the Suffolk County Police, in the coverage of the Shannon Gilbert case, they believed that she died uh, of natural causes, being exposed, perhaps drowned in the marsh. But they're not pointing to a murder. And Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison agreed with that, agreed with that assessment. And when we look into the autopsy of Shannon Gilbert, the Suffolk County Chief Medical Examiner ruled that it was inconclusive, that he could not determine cause of death. Don't forget she was out in the marsh for over a year. However, the family and I think attorney John Ray brought in former New York City Office of the Chief Medical Examiner, medical examiner, uh, Dr. Michael Bodden. And Michael Bodden ruled somewhat the same as the Suffolk County DA that the findings of, 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 of murder were also inconclusive. But then he said he, he saw what he considered the hyoid bone, well, not what he considered, but it, what was done to the hyoid bone, that the hy hyoid bone was fractured or cracked, which is sometimes indicative of death by asphyxia. So he determined that it was consistent with a homicide without really coming to that 
downright conclusion. However, he said it was consistent. So many people in this investigation are unsatisfied with the conclusion that the Suffolk County police came to in regards to the death of Shannon Gilbert. And Shannon Gilbert, again, was an escort. And the recent uh, press conference thrown by, uh, put together by John Ray, in which Rodney Harrison stood by his side, We'll get to that, of what he said that in one of those cases, Shannon Gilbert was picked up by a cab driver from a, a seedy hotel on Long Island and that Rex Uerman was the John she was with. So it's unclear whether that has been vetted. I'm going to play a little bit of the sort of the, disturb, the disturbing 911 call of Shannon Gilbert that, again, when you listen to it, it makes everyone believe that she was perhaps a victim of murder. There's somebody after me. What are you going to do? What are you going to do to me? Please, stop. Please, Mike. No, stop it, please. That is the voice of Shannon Gilbert calling 911 on May 1st of 2010. She was calling from the gated community of Oak Beach on Long Island in New York. Shannon was a prostitute who visited a client in that neighborhood. That call for help did not save her. Shannon disappeared. The initial search of the area Shannon was calling from did not reveal what happened to Shannon or where she was but it did uncover something even more shocking a series of bodies and a potential serial killer and as more bodies were discovered the search intensified and finally 18 months later shannon's body was found tonight we take a listen to the 911 call made by shannon which took 12 years to release and we try to uncover what happened to shannon how she died, and why this case has still not been solved. You know, there's a disturbing thing in itself. And when 12 years to release the 911 call, what, what was the secret nature of that? Wouldn't it be the best investigative practice to release that? And perhaps that might shake loose someone's memory or someone knows something? You know, if you see something or hear something, say something. But it wasn't released for 12 years, so no one knew about this. What Again, what was the secret of nature of not releasing this 911 call? Doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I'm Vinny Politan. Thank you so much for joining us tonight here on Closing Arguments. You know, when, when you're close to figuring it out. Okay, please, Trooper Fry. State police. Yeah, there's somebody after me. I'm sorry? There's somebody after me. Where are you? There's somebody after me. Okay, where are you? There's somebody after me. Where are you, ma'am? I don't know. Are you driving right now? No, I'm inside the house. I'm sorry? I'm inside the house. What house? I don't know. Can you choose where I am? I'm sorry? You can trace where I am. No, I can't. What's your callback number you're calling from? Huh? What phone number are you calling from? What is that for me? Please. Are you in Suffolk County or Nassau County? Um, I'm in Long Island. Where on Long Island are you? Okay, let's talk to you. Let's talk to you. No. Yeah, no. No. No, stop. No. Where in Long Island are you? In Suffolk County? Nassau County? Huh? Uh -huh. Why? Why are you calling me by my name? Why? Can you on the line? Stop. Please. 
Now, Joseph Brewer uh, was the John who that she was called to that scene. And the, the, the name, the other name you see on the screen, Michael Pack, was her chauffeur that drove her from New York City out to Long Island. Uh, the chauffeur slash pimp, they, they may say. But so the, all of these people had been extensively interviewed and investigated post this happening. This is why this gets so um, scary and so confusing. And in regards to this investigation, it has been investigated and reinvestigated. In fact, even the attorney, John Ray, uh, who is the attorney for the Gilbert family, he recently went back out there and took depositions from some of the people involved in this caper. So, you know, I, I, it's inconclusive. But according to, again, Rodney Harrison, who we we trusting, right? We are trusting Rodney Harrison as the police commissioner, as the person that righted this ship, that pointed this investigation into the wind, into the right direction. And he believes she died of a tragic accident. And that's coming from the Suffolk County Police Commissioner, who, again, we all trust and we all admire. So I'm I'm a little bit um, confused, like everyone. Please, into the door. No, time to go. Please, 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 please. 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 No, please. Please. Why? Please. 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 What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do to me? Why? Huh? Yeah, I don't know. It was canceled to me. Why? Wait, are you gonna kill me? Why are you gonna Again, Michael Pack is her driver, pimp, whatever you want to call it. So that that's that's one of the cases that I think that will we ever know the answer to this case? And then it, it's it's sort of exacerbated by the recent um, press conference uh, with Johnny Ray or John Ray, the attorney for the Gilbert family, who came up with some. Um, Witnesses, alleged witnesses that signed affidavits that certain things were alleged and certain things occurred. Now, these are uh, could be a subject of a show all by themselves. But one of the things that we many people question was, well, how do we know if any of this stuff that John Ray is presenting during this press conference? I'm going to play a little bit of the press conference. How do we know any of this? Is true, and why did Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison stand by his side during this? And this caused some um, friction between District Attorney uh, of Suffolk County, right, and Rodney Harrison. Uh, so let, let's play a little bit of this. All right, when you're ready, you tell me and I'll tell you I'm ready. Good afternoon, everybody. We're here today because new information has been, uh, has arisen in this case from witnesses who were so far unknown. Those witnesses, of which there are four, have given us statements two of whom have given us affidavits regarding this case 
regarding Rex Uriman and Shannon Gilbert and Karen uh, Vergata. Before I talk about them, first, I want you to be aware that here stands the commissioner, as you know, with me. And up until now, we have not made it known to the public that we have been working together on this case steadily since the time that I came to know Commissioner Harris a year ago, February. Uh, we, up until that point, the police department was very resistant to receiving any kind of evidence or information from my office, from what I was doing. That all changed significantly when uh, Commissioner Harris stepped in and we uh, began to collaborate. And we've collaborated ever since. That collaboration has had fruit. And that fruit, at least, are the witnesses I'm going to be talking about today, as well as other evidence and information which we have shared together. Now, is there a possibility that uh, Rodney Harrison stood by attorney John Ray because he wanted to slam the door on this information uh, coming in and per perhaps providing almost like a defense for Rex Ewerman. Because if they could create doubt by saying, well, why didn't you listen to attorney John Ray, who represented Shannon Gilbert's family, when he came forth with certain witnesses, why didn't you listen to him? And right now, guess what? Rodney Harrison can say, well, we did. We did. But this caused a, a lot of angst between Ray Tierney, the Suffolk County District Attorney, and, and Rodney Harrison. In fact, uh, a great amount of, of, of angst because... He Ray Tierney made a statement that was uh, that really. Uh, I'm seeing if I could find it. That uh, indicated that there was no reason to interview a uh, a defense attorney. Why, if he has information, let him come before the grand jury? That's how we investigate things. Uh, why are we listening to him? Uh, so, you know, and, and one of the at, at a press conference, uh, Rodney Harrison was asked, uh, or, or in regards to the press conference, um, did he believe that the evidence was credible, and uh, was and if Ewerman was a prime suspect in another murder, and Harrison responded like he always did, uh, it's still an ongoing investigation. We are leaving no stone unturned uh so these are the words of uh suffolk county district attorney ray tierney he blasted the press conference in a statement without providing any advance notice to the prosecutors pursuing this case in court or the gilgo beach homicide task force members investigating these murders day in and day out we watched today's press conference not knowing what was going to be reported, we will continue to investigate this case through the grand jury process and not through press conferences. No private attorneys are or have ever been members or agents of the task force. He added, any citizen who believes that they have relevant evidence regarding the Gilgo Beach investigation should report it to the investigative agencies that comp comprise the task force. Any attorneys representing victims or their families, by definition, have a conflict of interest and should not be part of the investigation. Accordingly, private attorneys are not part of the task force and potential witnesses should not be reaching out to a private attorney with an interest in the outcome of the case. So I think that speaks for, uh, for Ray Tierney and how he felt about this press conference between Rodney Harrison 
You know, one of the big things that I questioned after this press conference, and I fully understand why Rodney Harrison did it. And again, because if no one listens to Ray Tierney, who's been involved in this case probably longer than anybody, probably longer than most of the police, because he's represented the family of Shannon Gilbert. If no one listens to him, then could he not be a defense witness for Rex Uriman when this goes to trial? That's my thoughts. And that's the, one of the reasons I have those thoughts is because that's a distinct possibility. So maybe, just maybe, Rodney Harrison was thinking ahead that. And all of the information, and uh, John Ray, attorney John Ray, gives a lot of information here. And, well, I'm not going to play all of it, but the information that he gives really, really needs to be vetted. And what does that mean? Well, that means, what does an affidavit mean other than the person that makes the statement swears they're telling the truth. But does that mean it is the truth to their best recollection? So does all of that mean that these witnesses that Attorney John Ray have, can we vet their information? Can we vet what they said? Well, let, let's listen a little bit more to this. And with the police department, uh, and this, uh, therefore with the task force, so it is true to say that our cooperation has given rise to more substantial, valuable evidence in the entire case of the Long Island serial killer. So with that in mind, I'm very pleased that, that Commissioner Harrison has seen fit to open his mind and, and to do what I'm suggesting has been done. Uh, contrary to all those who have come before him. And he's approaching this case in the right way. He's the right man for the job, and he's done his job well. As to the witnesses, as to the evidence, in no particular order of importance, because so much of it is important. I have stood as a beacon to, as a civilian beacon, to the people who are involved in this case to come and talk where they didn't want to approach the police out of fear, out of apprehension, uh, out of a natural, some in some cases, a natural distaste for the police department because of the work these people were in. So they would then come to me and speak to me and I would interview them. See, that is absolutely true because uh, many people, again, people that are in the criminal uh, world and, and I would include, uh, sex workers as as part of that they may feel um or they do feel not only they they may feel they do feel that uh it's um they can't trust the police because they're involved in in, in committing crimes so but can they trust an attorney well yeah however does that mean that that they're their information that they're putting forth is um, is absolutely credible. That remains to be seen. I wanted to play a little bit of Asa Ellerup's attorney who appeared on News Nation with Dan Abrams in regards to the uh, John Ray press conference that he, he had with uh, Rodney Harrison. And this, um, this is... Um, Dan Abrams with the attorney for Asa Ellerup. Beach serial killer Rex Heuerman. It turns out his estranged wife may have known about his alleged double life, even supposedly accusing one of the sex workers who came to their home of stealing her clothing iron from their home. John Ray, attorney representing victims in this case, spoke today alongside Suffolk County Police Commissioner Rodney Harrison about what a witness told him about the wife, Asa Ellerup. He was a serial user of sex workers. He would sometimes have them come two at a time to his house, and his wife was home upstairs, and in one instance got very angry at one of the sex workers because the wife believed 
that the worker had stolen an iron from, you know, for ironing clothes and had uh, had it in the car with the driver. Bizarre, it sounds the sex worker allegedly accused of stealing the wife's iron, and that's what she was upset about. The estranged wife, whose attorney will join us in a moment, has not been named suspect, but her hair was found on duct tape on one victim and on the head of another, according to court records. The police commissioner did answer questions, too. We should point out he was not wearing his police uniform, as he has in uh, past press conferences about the case. We have the information. We're working it. And uh, we'll see where it leads us down the road. Now, the story gets even more bizarre. About an hour after that press conference, the DA's office released a scathing statement about it, saying, quote, without providing any advance notice to the prosecutors pursuing this case in court, or the Gilgo Beach Homicide Task Force members investigating these murders day in and day out. We watched today's press conference not knowing what was going to be reported. We will continue to investigate this case through the grand jury process and not through press conferences. The victim's family's attorney also revealed evidence that he says connects Hewerman to two more women who were found dead on Long Island, Shannon Gilbert and Karen Bergata. Bergata may have allegedly been in Hewerman's house with his wife. In the house was the wife of Rex Uerman and uh, Rex Uerman and the, the, the other girl. The other girl who we believe to be Karen Vergata. Uerman has been charged with three counts of first degree murder, three counts of second degree murder, and the deaths of Melissa uh, Bartholomew, Megan Waterman, Amberlyn Costello, after DNA evidence tied him to the killings. He's also the prime suspect in another case. Now, joining me now is Robert Mas Macedonio. Attorney representing Macedonia. Macedonia, I apologize. I practiced. I actually practiced it before I, I started too. Um, who joins us now? I appreciate it. All right, you've got a lot to respond to here. Let me just let you respond and uh, to what we just heard. All right, Dan. I think the DA's statement says it all. It's hard to take anyone serious wearing a purple hat at a press conference. You know, J Johnny Ray has tried to keep himself relevant in this case since the arrest of Rex Human. It's been stated several times, not only by the police commissioner who stood by him, by the DA's office, that Shannon Gilbert, who's Johnny's client, is not related to any of the other Gilgo victims. Um, so what he's desperately trying to do is link a civil defendant to his clients so he has somebody to sue to recoup the tens of thousands of dollars he has spent chasing his tail the past 12 years that he's been involved in this case. So is it it's not true? It's completely outlandish claims. I categorically deny him on behalf of Officer Element Eller up. It's it's just ridiculous. So so again, yeah, just to follow up on that, not true that she knew about the sex workers. It's not true. Look, taking an iron, you're gonna fight with someone taking an iron. You you go back. The allegations are go back several years ago. The children are are 34 and 26 now. So they were what teens, if not younger. The house is very small. Everybody's seen the house. So the allegation is. Small children are upstairs in the house. Why Rex has sex workers downstairs in the house? It makes no logical sense. It's a nice middle-class neighborhood. The houses are all very close together. Any of this would have been witnessed by any of the neighbors. It's just, it makes no relevant sense. You, you, like I said, you go back to the purple hat. He looks like he's more trying out for a part in the Willy Wonka movie than he is representing any victims. What? What about the, the hair, allegedly, her hair, allegedly on the duct tape of one of the victims well you, know, you have the hair but hair is of likeness until we get actual dna reports which none of us have seen you could have a hair of likeness the dna comes from the root of a hair i don't think any of that's been actually laid out in court it's a hair of her likeness so we'll, we'll wait to see the evidence comes out in court and really let this case be tried in the courtroom and not by johnny ray the at the at press conferences in, the, in addition to the police commissioner the police commissioner come the first of the year is no longer going to be the police commissioner we have a new county executive that's going to be elected, and they're going to appoint their own police commissioner. Mm. So, again, Rodney Harrison, not wearing his police uniform, not in coordination with the DA's office, who's run this task force. And to go back to Ray Tierney, Ray Tierney is probably the most qualified and non-political district attorney we've had in Suffolk County. Mm. So I, I trust his judgment. I trust the task force. We will do a thorough investigation. And to have John Ray bring out some victim that says they took an iron out of the house had a fight with us it's yeah. ludicrous bob macedonio so that was bob macedonio the attorney for s l his response to the um 
to the press conference by John Ray and um, Rodney Harris. He keeps dwelling on the fact Rodney Harris wasn't wearing his uniform. A police commissioner doesn't have to wear a uniform. I don't know where he gets that from. But uh, And then uh, that Ray Tierney's the least political. I've never seen a more political district attorney in my life. And we used to, when this case first started, we said uh, Ray Tierney never met a camera that he didn't like because he was on every damn TV sh uh, station uh, that that it was was out. So, uh, you know, all, all I'm questioning here is when this case first started, when they first made the arrest of Rex Human, they immediately cleared Asa Ellerup the wife of Rex Schumann. And I was I was a little bit um, suspect of that. Like, how did they just immediately clear her? How do they already have enough information to clear Rex Schumann's wife, Essa Ellerup? And they did that rather quickly. And then we have this press conference with attorney John Ray. And I don't have enough time to go over everything he said. You could do an entire show on the John Ray and uh, Rodney Harrison press conference. However, I think that jo that Rodney Harrison attended that press conference for a reason, and that was to get that information out there. And now they have to, the, the task force has to reinvestigate the information that John Ray gave. And if the information and the witnesses are credible, then they, they'll become part of this trial. If they're not credible, and if they can, there was one thing in, in the in, that he spoke about the first witness that she and a New York City narcotics detective, uh, and this had to be 27 years ago, because they mentioned a sex club named the Trapeze, La Trapeze in Manhattan, and they met in the city, and uh, he was an NYP narcotics detective. And they picked up a female in the city who had just gotten out of jail. And later on in this, as Johnny Ray's doing this presentation, he says, that woman was Karen Vergata. So that had to be 27 years ago. And so... There are a few things in that information that are checkable. Let's see if we can find that narcotics detective. What's his name? Let's see if Karen Vergata took an arrest 27 years ago in New York City. It should be in the database, right? So if none of those things come up positive, then that sort of taints the entire statement made by witness number one that uh, John Ray gave. And again, I'm not going to do an entire show on this right now. I'm just stating some of the things. So if any of that information uh, Ray and PC Harrison said they have the name of this detective. I haven't heard anyone say that Roger still, but uh, I have no reason not to believe you, but I haven't seen that anywhere. I've seen no documentation of that. Uh, and again, John Ray presenting all this evident evidence, and he says he has affidavits uh, from these witnesses, then surely these um, these witnesses can be re-interviewed by detectives, by the professionals, by and they can they can take them through the whole statement slowly and go back over it and go out and check things and bring them back in. That's what's known as vetting the information. Um, and we would then cooperate, I, them, and the police department. And so with that in mind, the first two witnesses I'm going to talk about are uh, both of them uh, are not Suffolk County residents. I should point out that uh, we obtained from these two affidavits their names will go unmentioned. Their, their names are blotted out of the affidavits. But the affidavits will be available to you right after the press conference. As to the first one I'll talk about, this is a witness who has 
every reason to have. All right. I, I spoke about what he's going to cover right there. Roger, still, thank you so much for the $5 super sticker. It was from a Ray interview. Great show as always. Thank you very much. Again, I got a little bit into the weeds today uh, because um, I think it's important. You know, the, the topic, the subject of this show today, of course, was that Rodney Harrison, the great Suffolk County police commissioner, former NYPD chief of department, chief of detectives, uh, is resigning. And again, no huge surprise for all you folks that are surprised. He would have had to resign in December or excuse me, or even January anyway, because there's going to be a new elected uh, county uh, executive that's uh, in charge of Suffolk County uh, next week, the election is. So that person, whoever that person is who gets elected, will undoubtedly be appointing their own uh, police commissioner. So all we can say is that Rodney Harrison um, has done a fantastic job. And I think the people of Suffolk County uh, owe him at least a round of applause. You know, uh, he did a fantastic job. I think there's no denying that. Uh, there he is in his NYPD. You noticed above his his shield, there's a green bar, and all cops know what that is, and that's called the Combat Cross, which is one of the highest medals. It means he got in a shootout and probably killed somebody. So Rodney Harrison was not only a great police uh, executive, but a, a great police officer and uh, a, you know, a role model for, for, for everyone. But, you know, I, I always said I, I never personally met Rodney Harrison. I knew of him. And one of my detectives is one of his best friends. But when I watched the 2020 riots in New York City, uh, they showed a video of Rodney Harrison in his in his chief of detectives uniform, rolling around on the ground with a looter who was looting a store. And I was like, there's a cop, man. There's a street cop who's chief of detectives. He's still a cop. And that said everything to me. And then Suffolk County was lucky enough, smart enough of uh, County Executive Ballone to appoint Rodney Harrison uh, as the police commissioner of Suffolk County. Ladies and gentlemen, if you're looking for a great attorney in the New York City metropolitan area, then Joe Murray is your man. Joe's a retired member of the service, a retired police officer, now a fantastic defense attorney. You can reach Joe on his cell phone at 718-514-3855. Email him at joe at jmurray-law.com. Go on his website, jmurray-law.com. Not only is Joe a fantastic defense attorney, but a huge supporter of the Police Off the Cuff uh, podcast. You know, guys, I, I don't think anyone can uh, can actually be like, oh, my God, Rodney Harrison's resigned. No, it, it was time to everything. Turn, turn, turn. There is a season. Turn, 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 right? And it was his turn. Uh, he did a fantastic job. He's only 54 years old. If he wants to take another police job in another jurisdiction, I'm sure he'll have his opportunities. He'll get another chance to do that. But for now, all we can say is Rodney Harrison, thank you. Thank you for the fantastic job you did. Thank you for your two years as the Suffolk County Police Commissioner. And Godspeed. And we wish you much, much success in whatever you decide to do in the future. From Police Off the Cuff, Real Crime Stories, I'm your host, retired NYPD Sergeant Bill Cannon, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you so much for tuning in.